Good morning. Good morning. Maybe our older people can take a lesson from our youngest in the group this morning. When I come to the platform, Waylon stands up. <laughs> I appreciate that. Good to see you. Good morning to you all. Got another one standing. There's two. It's good to be in God's house this morning. We're here to worship our living Heavenly Father. What an opportunity. Amen. What a privilege to do that. I think we'll get all the business stuff out of the road before we enter into our worship service, my dear. Good morning. Welcome to Bethel Baptist Church. Uh, at 5 o'clock this evening, join us on Facebook. Uh, we will be getting a study on the life of David. Wednesday at 7 o'clock, join us in person here at the church for a prayer meeting. Um, join us next Sunday morning at 915. Uh, we're going through the book of Genesis in Sunday school and if you are not here you are missing out. And be in prayer for uh, Vacation Bible School July 22 through 25. It's not too early to start praying for those involved and for the kids that will be here. And if this is on Vacation Bible School, it isn't for just a few weeks yet, but as she said, now is the time to start praying. So Vacation Bible School has started right now in our prayer life. So uh, remember that this year. Trust that we can get uh, many young people into, the, into our Vacation Bible School so they can learn about Jesus Christ. There's some people, some young people, that's the only time of the year they ever enter the church building. So uh, we need to heavily cover that in prayer. I'm going to give you a couple minutes to prepare your own hearts as we uh, enter into our worship service, and then I will follow up. Father, Thank you this morning. Thank you for the opportunity we have to come to your house as a body. We realize that we can worship you anywhere, anytime, any day. And we should do that. But Father, we have the opportunity this morning as a group, as a, a church group, to come together to worship you for your goodness this morning. Father, we thank you for what you're doing in each and every one of our lives. We have evidence in this very room this morning of what you've done in the years past, just the last couple of years of miracles, mm -hmm. answers to prayer, leading and guiding wisdom. Father, you have blessed us in a mighty way. Thank you. As we worship you this morning, we come fully intending to sing praises to you. We come fully intending to open our hearts, and we pray that you would cause us to have that attitude of an open heart as the Word of God has opened up this morning. Cause us to be convicted. Cause us to react upon that conviction this morning. We'll give you the praise and the glory for your worthy of our praise and worship this morning. Yes, Father. Amen. Amen. 307. Send the light standing with me, please. There's a call come ringing over the restless way. Send the light. Send the light. There are souls who rescue. There are souls who Send the light, send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. We have heard the Macedonian call today, 
saying one more stanza that we may get all kinds of light lightning enough huh <laughs> I don't know what quite happened there but it's it happened 299 rescue the perishing rescue the perishing care for the dying snatch them in pity from sin and the grave Jesus will save down in the human heart crushed by the tempter feeling the burden the grace can restore teach by the loving heart weak by the kindness rescue the perishing kid the next one 303 we're not quite so familiar with it so I know you're going to sing it out loud people need the Lord
more familiar with it. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. At the end of the broken dreams, He's the open door. People need the Lord. People need. Thank you all for your singing this morning. You may be seated. Pastor. Amen. <clears throat> I will turn on my mic. Our last study in the book of James. James is one of the most practical books in the New Testament. James talks about our tongue, and he talks about our life. Today we're going to talk about something that's really, really important. Daniel chapter 12, verse 3 says, Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. God speaks to us about winning lost people. If you have your Bible with you, I would encourage you to turn to the book of James, chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. As James concludes his message to his, the tribe that are scattered abroad, the last things he wants them to know, after dealing with sin in people's lives, after dealing with healing in people's lives, he says this in verse 19, James 5, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Father, guide us in the study of your word. Direct our hearts, direct our minds. Help us as we look at this issue of soul winning. Help us to be concerned for those who are outside the kingdom. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, soul winning is perhaps the easiest thing that somebody can do and the hardest thing that someone can do. It's hard to come into someone's life and tell them the gospel message when perhaps they don't even want to hear it. It's hard to tell somebody that their only way to get to heaven is through a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Last Wednesday night, I got home and had a message. Could you call me, please? And it was about someone we had been praying for who had passed away. And he said, would you pray for me? I have got to share to a large group of people the fact that their only way to get to heaven is through the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the gospel message isn't all that hard. The gospel message tells me that I am a hopeless, lost sinner. And that I am estranged from God because of what I've done. Whether I've lied or I've cheated. Whether I've stolen. And it goes on and on and tells me. If I've coveted something that belongs to somebody, I am condemned before a holy God. The Bible tells me that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. He paid the penalty for my sin. And so that what I must do is turn from my sin to Jesus and place my trust in him as my personal Savior. And that's easy to talk about. But it's hard to do, isn't it? It's hard to admit that I'm a lost sinner, and it's hard to admit that I have no power in myself, and I can't be good enough. I can't do enough good works to make up for the bad things I've done. 
But it's the most simple message you can ever preach. And James 5 talks about that message. You see, there's a tragedy when it comes to sinners. Sinners are lost, and we are all sinners. You know, I, I sometimes think that we have a misconception about what the church is supposed to be about. We somehow think that this is our little gathering. We gather each one of us together with our happy, newly washed faces, our, our sharply pressed clothes, and, and we gather together, and we're our little bitty group, and when you talk to somebody, how are you doing? I'm doing just great. I'm doing fine. And everything is wonderful. And we don't realize that there are people that we meet and people who come to church that have some issues. We want things to be perfect in every way. Everything, everything on the shelf in the right place. Everything looks good, and I look good on the outside. And we give the impression that we never have problems, or we never struggle. I remember talking to somebody at a motorcycle rally, asking if I could pray for him. He says, I'm a pagan. You don't need to bother praying for me. He says, I'll pray for you. And um, in fact, last weekend, I, th I said, well, you know, God loves atheists too. Um, but as I walked off, he asked me, he says, hey, I do have a question for you. You're a Christian, right? He says, yeah. Do you ever have any problems or is everything just perfect for you? And I said, you got to be kidding me. you got a couple hours for me to share with you. Yeah, I've got problems. And one of the problems we face is that sometimes we forget that Satan is at work in our lives. Satan is the prince of the power of the air. Jesus said he is a thief, and he comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. Satan is involved in people's lives in that he blinds their hearts and their minds so they won't accept the gospel. Satan's influence can draw you from the Lord. Satan's influence can make you think that sin is okay and it's I'm just perfect. Satan can lead you astray. In fact, when you think of Paul's great fear, you know the Apostle Paul, the guy who wrote most of the epistles that we study in our Bible. Paul's great fear was found in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, where he said in verse 26, Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but get this, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Whoa. Here's a preacher who says, I have a great fear that I will be disqualified. I think the King James Version translates it a castaway. Someone who's not used by God. Someone God can't use. Someone who has walked away from the truth, walked away from the narrow way. Jesus said in John chapter 7, verse 13, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. The Bible teaches us that the path of the believer is a narrow path. And James talks about those who wander from the truth. You know what it's like to wander, don't you? Now, there are times I like to wander. There are times that I do not like to see people wander. Usually when I'm on the road and I'm following somebody or meeting somebody, I just hate to see them wander on that roadway. You know what I'm saying? I still remember the Facebook post. Somebody says, I hate it when I'm scrolling through Facebook and a jogger bounces off my windshield. <laughs> I hope you don't do that and I hope you don't wander. But you know, we can wander in life. We can get off the right path. We can step aside and start heading the wrong way. The truth is pretty well known in the Word of God. 
The scripture tells us that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The scripture tells us that Jesus came to bear witness of the truth. And there are times that those who are followers of Jesus or those who are looking at following Jesus step away from the truth. I am amazed at the people who will add to the Word of God and they will make stuff up. Uh, my kids used to have a phrase when somebody would say something, they'd say, is that made up? That sounds made up. Um, and I like that phrase. You see, there are those who will combine the Word of God with false belief and speak of it as truth. I just read something the other day that basically mixed Buddhism with Christianity, and I said, that's not what the Bible says, and it's not truth. There is a potential for people to stray in our lives. I thought about how people stray this week. People can stray because of sin. Have you ever noticed that when you allow sin in your life and you allow sin to take place in your life and you begin excusing that sin, it's not long before you stray away from the truth. I had a friend who kept a book, a little, you know, one of them little spiral books, and he would write down in that book the names and dates of pastors who got involved in sin and they left the Lord, basically left the truth, left the Word of God, left our churches and just walked away from Christianity. And the book was thick. We were talking one day. He carried that with him and I said, you know what I'd do with that book if I were you? I'd throw it in a burn barrel and burn it up. Get rid of it. You don't need that reminder. But it is a stark reminder of how Satan gets into our lives through sin. People can stray through perhaps an intellectual pursuit that's not biblical. I do not believe the Bible is anti-intellectual. In fact, some of the greatest intellectuals that ever lived are, are, got their intellect and their beginning and their rules of logic from the Word of God. But you know, you can start listening to the wrong stuff and you can stray from the Lord. You can perhaps look at things a completely different way than the Bible because you are a quasi-intellectual. I see that happening all the time. Again, the guy that told me he was an atheist. I talked to him later and I realized why he was an atheist because he didn't want to believe the Bible. It came down to that. There are those who stray from the truth because they made a profession of faith. They walked an aisle, they prayed a prayer, but they were never truly born again. They had the sorrow of man, and they had the sorrow for sin, but they did not have the sorrow of repentance and did not turn from that sin, did not turn from the way. And there are people in churches that are not born again. We know that. There are people that attend services every Sunday, and I, bet, I don't want to pick on folk in the amen corner, because I believe they're believers, but you know, there are people in the amen corner that don't know the Lord Jesus. There was a revival started down in Des Moines a few years ago, a real great revival in one of our churches, and it began with this. One of the people in the church, it was one of the leaders of the church, came to the pastor's office early, before church. And he said, Pastor, I need to talk to you. And he said, I don't think I'm saved. I don't think I've ever trusted in Jesus as my personal Savior. The man trusted Christ as Savior, got on fire for the Lord, and, and that revival swept through a church of people who were professing Christians. But they were never really born again. We can stray from the truth if we are not truly born again, if God has not changed our heart. 
And we see that it affects many, many people when we fall away from the Lord. 1 John chapter 2 talks about the things that will draw you from the Lord Jesus. In verse 15, the scripture says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh... The lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Those are the three ways Satan can get you. It is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. You see, Satan can draw you astray. And I believe James chapter 5 is talking about those who have never truly been born again. And talking about those who have been born again and they've wandered away. And they have jeopardized their physical life in this world because they've walked away from the Lord. Many lives are affected when someone walks away from the Lord. We know that. When a believer wanders from God, it doesn't just affect them. This morning in Sunday school, we saw the study of how a man's sin, his compromise with the world, affected his wife and his two daughters in a bad, bad way. And those effects we're seeing even today. The world looks on the falling away of a Christian with delight. But you know there's some encouragement in this passage. This passage talks about the one who turns him back. There's a blessing to know that as a soul winner, you have an impact in our world. We wonder sometimes when we serve the Lord if we're really doing any good. There are times where I wonder, am I just wasting my breath and wasting my time? And I still remember a few years ago, I got a note from somebody. That somebody's a pastor. And he, he wrote me a note, it was an email, and he told me this story about a young man who had visited his church and they had him over for dinner um, during that visit and his family. And this, this pastor asked, how in the world did you come to know the Lord Jesus as your Savior? And this young man said one time after vacation Bible school and mentioned my name showed me how to be saved and I accepted Jesus as my Savior. And the guy stuck out his hand this pastor said, well congratulations me too. Same guy. I needed that encouragement. I needed to realize that some of the things we do is important. When you, when you think your life and your ministry is fruitless, understand what God says here. We are in the business of saving souls and saving lives. I did not realize how souls stand in jeopardy every day until I started telling people about Jesus. And I realize that many people I talk to every day are a heartbeat from eternity and they will spend eternity somewhere. And I realize how important this business of telling people about Jesus is. You realize that if you are telling somebody about the Lord Jesus and how to be saved. You may not be the one to reap, but you, according to this passage, if you turn a sinner from the error of his way, you save a soul from death. Wow. Turning a sinner, that's what we call conversion. Listen, somebody can make a decision and never change. They're not converted. They don't know Jesus. You see, the, sal the, the gospel message creates a change in people's lives. And the picture that we have is of the good shepherd. Look at Luke 15 with me. Luke chapter 15. There are three stories told here. I think the Lord Jesus gives us these parables and gives us the picture 
because he wants us to understand how important it is to turn a soul from destruction. There's a picture of the lost sheep, the picture of the lost coin, and the picture of the lost son. The lost sheep is one of my favorites, where Jesus says in verse 4 of Luke 15, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which is lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Can you imagine? There's joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. Some of you remember Tom Curtis came to us with um, SOS Ministries. And Tom Curtis had a, a little deal that he did, three things God cannot do. Remember that? Tom was telling me about someone who he had led to Christ at the county fair. And the person contacted him later and said, I came to my church and my pastor acted like it was no big deal. And they said, oh yeah, you'll get over that, basically, when you get older. And Tom told him this. He says, you need to go to a church where they react like the angels of heaven when somebody comes to Christ, that they rejoice. There is rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that turns around. One sinner that repents. One sinner that comes to know Jesus. And I'll tell you, it, I kind of rejoice when I hear about it too. It's a blessed thing. The business of the follower of Jesus Christ is to share the gospel with the lost. We are in the business of turning sinners from the error of their way and drawing them to the Lord Jesus Christ. A few years ago, I referenced this book. I said, told somebody that I'd pay them double if they could find the book somewhere. And they looked on the used bookstores sites, and there was one for $250. And I thought, whoops, and they didn't, they didn't hold me to that. I found the book this week on, and on um, Kindle, and it was free. I will pay double that free price any day. <laughs> Amy Carmichael was a missionary to India. Amy Carmichael basically gave her life to the Lord. She said the call to mission work is a call to die. She wrote about the mission work in India as she was rescuing women from being trafficked, basically. And she wrote this as she spoke in the night. This is from chapter 6, Amy Carmichael, Things as They Are. I think they hit us hard. It says, the tom-tom stumped -tom straight all night. And the darkness shuddered round me like a living, feeling thing. I could not go to sleep, so I lay awake and looked. And I saw, as it seemed to me, that I stood on a grassy sward. And, in other words, a, a grassy um, uh, clear patch. And at my feet, a precipice broke sheer down into infinite space. I looked but saw no bottom, only cloud shapes, black and furiously coiled, and a great shadow shrouded hollows and unfathomable depths. Back I drew dizzy at the depth. Then I saw forms of people moving single file across the grass. They were making for the edge. There was a woman with a baby in her arms and another little child holding onto her dress. She was on the very verge. Then I saw that she was blind. She lifted her foot for the next step. It trod air. She was over and the children over with it. Oh, the cry as they went over. Then I saw more streams of people flowing from all quarters. All were blind stone blind, all made straight for the precipice edge. There were shrieks as they suddenly knew themselves following, tossing up of helpless arms, catching, clutching at empty air. But some went over quietly and fell without a sound. Then I wondered, what a wonder that was simply agony. Why no one stopped them at the edge? I could not. I was glued to the ground. And I could not call, though I strained and tried. Only a whisper would come. Then I saw along the edge there were sentries set at intervals. Intervals. 
But the intervals were far too great, and there were wide, unguarded gaps between. And all over these gaps, the people fell into their blindness, quite unwarned. And the green grass seemed blood red to me, and the gulf yawned like the mouth of hell. Then I saw a little picture of peace. A group of people under some trees with their backs turned toward the gulf. They were making daisy chains. Sometimes when a piercing shriek would cut the quiet air and reach them, it disturbed them, and he thought it a rather vulgar noise. And if one of their number started up and wanted to go and do something to help, then all the others would pull that one down. Why should you get so excited about it? You must wait for a definite call to go. You haven't finished your daisy chain yet. It would be really selfish, they said, to leave us to finish the work alone. There was another group. It was made up of people whose great desire was to get more sentries out, but they found that very few wanted to go, and sometimes there were no sentries set for miles and miles on the edge. Once a girl stood alone in her place, waving the people back, but her mother and other relations called and reminded her that her furlough was due. She must not break the rules, and being tired and needing a chance, she had to go and rest for a while, but no one was sent to guard her gap. And over and over the people fell like a waterfall of souls. Once a child caught at a tuft of grass that grew at the very brink of the gulf. It clung convulsively. It called, but nobody seemed to hear. Then the roots of the grass gave way, and with a cry, the child went over its two little hands still holding tight to the torn off bunch of grass. And the girl who longed to be back in her gap thought she heard the little one cry, and she sprang up and wanted to go, at which they reproved her, reminding her that no one is necessary anywhere. The gap would be well taken care of, they knew. And then they sang a hymn. Then through the hymn came another sound, like a million pain of a million broken hearts, wrung out in the full drop, one sob, and a horror of great darkness was upon me, for I knew what it was, the cry of the blood. Then thundered a voice, the voice of the Lord, and he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth out unto me from the ground. The tom-tom still beat heavily. The darkness still shuddered and shivered about me. I heard the yells of the devil dancers and the weird, weird, weird wild shriek of the devil, possess, the devil possessed just outside the gate. What does it matter after all? It has gone on for years. It will go on for years. Why make such a fuss about it? Amy Carmichael was describing what happens in Christian circles. And there are those who are scattered along the cliffside to warn people to turn back. <coughs> and most of Christianity was sitting there making daisy chains while the world went to hell. Our job, beloved, is to be in that gap turning people back. And here's what happens if you turn someone back. You save a soul from death. I, I think of that. There are a couple for the unbeliever. You save them from eternal death in the lake of fire. I will never get over the beauty of someone who comes to Christ. I will never get over the absolute blessing of those who we can snatch from the burning fire and pull to salvation and to, and, and to be taken care of. And there's another group that we reach out to, and that's the true believer who has gotten off the track. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 11, which deals with the Lord's table, that when you come to the table and you got sin and you don't deal with it, many are weak and sickly among us and many sleep, many die. There are those of us who share the need for that person to come back to the Lord, and we literally save them from a premature death. Beloved, According to James chapter 5, the great blessing is to turn a sinner from the error of their way, to save them from death. And then there's a, a, a trust here that I see that is so important. And to cover a multitude of sins. Why? I thought we should expose sin. 
You understand that when someone comes to Christ as Savior, the first thing that we know about that is that every sinful deed they've done is under the blood. I don't forgive sins, except those who've sinned against me, of course. I am not in the position of granting absolution to people. But I have been in the place where sin has been forgiven. And it doesn't matter what sin you've committed. You think about it. Jesus died for the sins of the world. It doesn't matter how far down you've gone, how bad you've been. Of course, we've got a way of describing badness that maybe is not biblical. I'm letting you know that when someone trusts in Jesus as their Savior, their sin is covered by the blood. I also see another aspect of this, of a sacred trust. There are people who have come to me and they've trusted in Jesus as Savior and they have laid out for me a tale of their misdeeds and sins that when no one will ever know about from me. I have a trust there. I have sat in a jail cell with people. Actually, it was not a, really a jail cell. It was sometimes through the phone and sometimes in a lawyer's conference room with people where they have trusted Christ as Savior and they've revealed everything that they've done wrong. And you'll never know it. In fact, I ran into one the other day that came to know Jesus in a jail cell and he was with a friend. And, and this guy proceeded to describe his salvation. Not a word from me, because I wasn't going to tell him where he came to know Christ. It was in a jail cell. People entrust us with some of their darkest secrets. And we have a trust as soul winners not to share it. Not to tell people. Not to gossip about it. No one will ever know. Now, there's some sins that need to be dealt with. We know that. They need to be told about. By the way, yeah, you know, there's some things that if it has to be dealt with, it's dealing with abuse. Um, we're going to talk to law enforcement about that. I'm sorry, that's going to happen. And you will go with me or, <laughs> or I'll go alone. But there are some occasions where no one ever needs to know what someone else has done. We who win the lost help them to find forgiveness and refuse to gossip about where they came from. And that's an exciting place to be as well. We don't talk about what that person has committed. It's laid on the shoulders of Jesus. We don't have to talk about even wrongs done to us. I've had occasions where someone has wronged me deeply and later on has come to know Jesus as Savior. And you know what? There will ne no one will ever know what they did to me because I'm not going to talk about it. It's under the blood. The Bible tells us that there is a trust given to the soul winner. I think so many of us glory in past sin. We glory, and, and listen, if God saved you from a rotten lifestyle and a rotten place, praise the Lord. You ought to be thankful for what God saved you from. But we don't need to share that with each other either. The soul winner covers a multitude of sins. That is a trust. Today, as we look at the soul winner's job, I want to encourage you to be committed to that trust. To be committed to the trust to tell people about knowing Jesus. We do that everywhere we go. We live the life and then we share the gospel message. And if someone wanders from the truth, someone steps out of the path, someone goes in the wrong place, our job is to try to pull them back into the path. Pull them back into that place of fellowship with the Lord. Never once discussing it with someone else. As I read James chapter 5 verses 19 and 20, 
I cannot go there except to appeal to you to be that one who stands in the gap. To say, I'm going to stand between lost sinners and a God that wants to save them. I'm going to be there to stand between them and destruction and tell them about the Jesus who can save their soul and forgive their sins. Maybe you're here today. Maybe you're watching online today. And you say, Pastor, I'm not sure that I've been there. I am not sure that I've really trusted in Jesus. Or maybe you're saying, I've wandered from the path. I'm here to encourage you to get back on the path. I'm here to encourage you to begin on the path, to trust in Jesus as your Savior. I'm here to beg you to walk with Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we think about how important a mission we have before us. How there are so many people without Christ in this world that are perishing. Help us to be the one to stand in the gap. Help us to be the one to draw them to Jesus. Help us to be the one that rescues them from death. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'd like to gather at the Lord's table this morning for a few minutes. Kind of um, important that we do that. We uh, song that we'd like to sing, Jesus, keep me near the cross. We'd like, like our deacons to come as we sing that first verse, as we sit and worship around the table. Let's stand together as we sing this. Two, 385, I'm sorry, 385, let's stand together. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain, free to all a healing stream, flows from Calvary's mountain. in the cross be my glory ever till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river you may be seated <laughs> you know once a month we gather at the Lord's table and we realize it does not impart grace. Um, you're no more saved having come to this table than you were before. This bread, this fruit of the vine does not save you. It does not give you forgiveness of sins. But what it is, it's a remembrance of what Jesus did for us. When I think of his body, that was given for us and the torture he went through he did it because he loves us mm -hmm. and it's his body his body given for us his life that was poured out for us that gives us a relationship with God the fruit of the vine the, the cup reminds us of the blood of Jesus that was shed that covers our sins this is a time that if you're not right with the Lord it's a time to get right with the Lord. Amen. If you've got something between you and the Lord, this is a time to get right with the Lord. And I encourage you to do that as we gather at this table. I'd like to ask Brother Verve Davidson to lead us in prayer, remembering the blood, that, the body that was given to us, the, the bread, the blood, the body given to us. Dear Lord, We thank you so much, dear Lord, for the body you gave to us. The body that has brought us all we have now, salvation. Yes, Father. We thank you so much for that, dear Lord. We pray that as we partake of this, that we'll 
realize what that body has given. Mm -hmm. sins. You shed it to, to give us life everlasting. Father, we need to pause. We need to thank you. We need to give you the praise in it all. In your precious name. Amen. Amen.
And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Matthew 26 also gives us a promise. Jesus says to us, I say to you, I'll not drink of this fruit of this drink of the of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. The next time, it could be that the Lord Jesus Himself will be serving the elements and will be remembering in His very presence the fact that He gave His life for us. Scripture says they sang a song, a hymn, and went out. And I think that's a good way to close our service as we sing that last verse of 385. Near the cross, I'll watch and wait. Let's stand together.